Good morning, congregation of the Most High. It's always a pleasure to present the eternal word of our Father to the congregation that he pitched and not man. We want to uh, thank the young man that had the courage to come up here and stand before you and read the scriptures that was read in your hearing. Uh, that Brother Carlos Jr., is that him? Okay. Yeah. We need more young people in, in the congregation because the congregation that I attend out there in Pittsburgh, it's, uh, it's empty. So that, you know, we, we out there in Pittsburgh, we need to get busy and get them kids into the building. You know, our message this morning, I don't know if uh, Brother Derek or Brother uh, Kennedy Reveal that to you, but it is, is redemption a reality to you? Is redemption a reality to you? You know, back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, God, the Elohim, did something because of the action of his created being. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So when we look at Ecclesiastes chapter three in verse 14, Get over there. What is that? Hold on here. Where am I at here? Give me a second. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. At verse 14 says, I perceive that whatever God does is forever, endures forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God has done it. Why? Why? So that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks that which has been driven away. You know, when he drove Adam, and Eve out of the garden, he placed that flaming sword there to protect the way to the tree of life. Now, that way has been opened up to us again through Jesus Christ. God seeks that which was driven away. He pursues it. All you have to do is look at Jonah, how he pursued Jonah. And Jonah had a change of heart after he suffered a little bit. So it is with our lesson today is reality. Is redemption a reality to you? You know, my reality and the reality of a philosopher or some great college teacher may not be in concordance with one another, you see. But reality, uh, as it is today, the world or the state of things as they actually exist, right, as opposed to idealistic or rational ideas or notions, right? Reality is the state or quality of having existence or substance. We have existence. We have substance, right? Redemption, we know what redemption is, is, is the act of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. And that's what Christ has done for us today. 
in our reading, uh, in our hearing of the text scriptures that was read in your hearing in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There are a few things that has taken place in, in these verses right here. First of all, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He has translated us or transferred us from the kingdom, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. We also have redemption in him and the forgiveness of sin. So, my first point is that the plan of redemption called for an incarnation. Apart from Jesus Christ coming into this world, we would be lost and without hope. You see, so redemption had to have someone that was qualified to come and offer himself as a sacrifice, right? So a person born into this world, ruled by Satan, do not by nature know his creator. Is that a fair statement? Is that okay with you? Because I believe it is. Because a, a person, anyone born into this world, once they become a man or a woman, still by nature, does not know the creator. Well, do we have scriptural proof for that? For number one, in John chapter 14 and verse 30, you know, Jesus told his disciples after speaking with them, he says, I will no longer talk to you much uh, with you for the ruler of this world has no claim on me. So he lets them know who the ruler of this world is, right? So the ruler has claim on people of the world, but for Jesus, no, why? Because Jesus in his flesh was without sin. So Satan can't put a claim on our Lord. A person born into this world by nature, no, not God. So when we look at the story of Hannah over in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3 in verse 7, when Hannah prayed to the Lord for a son, and once she uh, would be given that child, she would lend that child to the Lord all his life, right? So that had taken place. So the time came, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So you see, a natural man cannot know God cannot have a relationship with God until when? What has to happen? The word has to be revealed to him. See, that's why we have the Bible. So that the word can be revealed to us. That way we can come into a relationship with our father. Right? A man was a key figure in the fall. And a man had to be a key figure in redemption. When we look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 5, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God in the free gift by grace that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So we see that what Adam did had affected us in a way that it cost us death. But what Christ came and done 
far exceeded that, overflowed with grace. You see, when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 45 through 49, it says, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, right? But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural. And, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man was from heaven. As we, as was the first, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man in heaven. You see, before we come to the realization that, man, I'm a sinner, how can I get rid of this? I need to be baptized. I need to be uh, to become a child of God. It is only through the scriptures that a person can understand this and come to the realization of that. The object of the incarnation was that man might be given the opportunity to become a child of God by receiving the nature of God. You see, just as the scriptures that I have read in your hearing, as we bore the image of Adam, we shall also bear the image of Christ. In John 1 and 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, as the word, existed long before the foundation of creation as in the book of uh what book is that i'm thinking of first samuel i do believe it is when david was speaking about building a house for god he said what what house is this that you will build for me the heavens and the heavens of heavens can't contain me. How will you build a house for me? You see, the creation is not big enough to contain our father. So that's why he is separate from creation, yet he manifested himself and came as a man. In order for us to become a child of God, we see that in 1 John chapter 3, not 1 John, St. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, talks about the rebirth. And those who have been washed and baptized in water and by the Spirit, right, are born again. And those of us who have been and went through that transformation become like the wind. You don't know where, how, where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. So it is with the children of God. You don't understand it. And in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we see that we become partakers of the divine nature of God. You see, man could only receive eternal life only after he had been legally removed from Satan's authority. So while our father was doing all of his work, the heavens are witnessing this. The angels are witnessing what is happening. Imagine that. How that, what you, what, that which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. So when God wrote his book and sent it and everything was complete, now all he, had, all he do is everything play out now. Everything is playing out now. The kingdom is here. We are being baptized into the kingdom. We see that there had to have been some things that had to take place in order for us to be moved, transitioned from one place to another. And 
one had to be chosen for that mission. And that one was Paul, as we read in Acts chapter 26, verses 12 through 18. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun. This is a light that will be shining for us in the new kingdom. There will be no need for the sun. It will be Christ himself and our father as the light that shone all around me and those who journeyed with me. And when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. If you ever stumped your toe on a, on a chair or a corner, you know what that feels like, right? That hurts. I tell you, so Paul is, the Lord is trying to get Paul to see that you're doing something that is going to injure yourself. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand up on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and they place among those who are sanctified by me in faith. This is what Paul's mission was, you see. And now my second point is the exchange, the great exchange. See, your standing is important just as well as your position. There must be a foundation for anyone to stand. You know, in uh, Job, over there in Job, I think is uh, chapter 30 or 33, one of those chapters where all the sons of God came together and were singing and were joyful because of what they had seen come into existence. But prior to that, when, when the Lord asked Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You see, everything has a foundation. Creation has a foundation. The earth has a foundation. We have foundation under our feet. Where do you stand? It, it is important that you know where you stand. You see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1, everybody don't stand on the same level. Everybody don't stand on the same ground. You see, now I will remind you brothers of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand. Everyone don't stand in the gospel. You have people standing in other faiths that they believe that they are right and have a book side by side with this book, right? That's what they do. First Corinthians 3 and 11 says, for no one can lay a foundation which that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Our foundation is Christ. We build our lives on Christ, right? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Rock is a representation of something firm and solid. See, we have a firm and solid foundation that we stand on. Only if we believe in what we have received. You see, in Hebrews chapter 3, in verse 6, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, right? And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence in our boasting in our hope.
You see, we are the house of God, of Christ. He purchased it with his own blood, according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. You see, redemption revolves around our identification. Talk to you about our standing, talking to you about how you identify. When you get pulled over by a cop for doing 60 in a 25 mile an hour zone, first thing he's going to say to you when he come to your car, roll your window down, license and registration, please. You got to identify yourself. Who do you identify with? You see, we identify ourselves with Christ. Because we are Hebrews. We have crossed over the river. That's what a Hebrew is. When you cross over that river right there, that's, that's, that's like uh, Moses in the Red Sea. He is saving you. He is transitioning you from one place to another. Right? So that's, that's what it is. See, if you're not in Christ, where, where are you? Who do you identify with? You identify with Adam. If you are in Adam, you don't identify with Christ. It's identification, right? So what does that mean? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 21, for as by one man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. You see, when the revelation was revealed to Paul concerning these items here, right? We have to understand that if you're in Adam, you can't identify with Christ because watch what happens. In Ephesians chapter one, in verse 13. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. You remember when Peter preached the first sermon, and those who accepted it, 3,000 souls were baptized, and the, the promise of the Holy Spirit, right? This is the seal that God has set on us so that he knows his property. He knows who belongs to him. We can say in the world, I am a child of God. I hear that all the time. Sometimes I'll question it. Sometimes I'll leave it alone because I don't want to get in an argument with a person concerning what they believe in. Christ said, leave them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. So if you want to stay blind, you stay blind. But I'm going to give you something that's going to help you. You see, in 2 Timothy 2 and 19, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Right? Let everyone who names the name of the Lord do what? Time to lift up your anchor. Depart from iniquity. Right? I'm going to be closing up here real quick. Identification is twofold. How you identify what you identify with. Adam or Jesus. It's just that simple. But people don't want to accept that. They don't want to come to Christ. Why? I'm going to do what I want to do. That's why. You have so many congregations meeting today, and a whole bunch of those congregations have not been planted by the Lord. Every plant which my heavenly Father had not planted shall be uprooted. So we leave them alone. 
1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For as by one man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. We must, when we talk to people about Christ and about salvation, here it is, it's twofold. Either you are in death or you are in life. From the, from the beginning of the scriptures to the end, it's about death and life. What do you choose? In Genesis 3 and 24, the way to life, uh, to the tree of life was set, cut. You couldn't get to it. Couldn't get to it. Now he has made it possible for us to get to it. There are two sides to redemption. The legal side, that which has been done, and the vital side, what is being done in us today. You see, the legal side speaks on what God did through Christ. How that he manifested himself. He was born of virgin birth. He lived a life of sinlessness. He died, was buried, he resurrected, and he ascended. And now he is reigning supreme throughout the universe. Oh, weep no more, my Lord. The lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. He has begun to open the scroll and read it. Do you not know that Jesus will be reading from the scroll for all eternity? That day will come for us you see this redemption was revealed to paul in my conclusion galatians chapter 1 verses 1 through 5. paul an apostle not from man nor through man but through jesus christ and god the father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of galatia you see when we speak of churches in the scriptures, there were no Protestants. There were no Baptists. There were no Methodists, right? There wasn't a, uh, where Mary, where they worship Mary, was the name of that? Catholics, you see? None of that existed. So if you, decide that you want to go and attend something like that, know that that's not even in the scripture. You can't, I can't go and sit with you at uh, a Baptist church. Are you kidding me? So, no, we can't, we can't have that to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he do? He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, in order for us to understand this, you know, who made the ears for hearing? Who made the eyes, right? Ephesians 1 and 18, and I'm through. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened did you know that your heart has eyes <laughs> you must have spiritual eyes to be able to see spiritual things you can't see spiritual things with natural eyes right having the eyes of our understand having the eyes of our hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which god has called you what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? There's nothing greater than knowing that something great, greater than gold or silver has been sealed in you. That is my message this morning. I want to thank the brothers here and the sisters as well for uh, inviting me here to speak the words of life. 
that's it thank you